All right, it is 4.30, so I'd like to call the April 27th meeting of the Legislative and Governmental Affairs Committee to order. Pursuant to the Illinois Attorney General's guidance to public bodies on the Open Meetings Act during the COVID-19 pandemic dated July 2nd, 2020, county board members may participate without being physically present in compliance with the established provisions. So let us take a roll call, please. Teresa? Yes. Uh, Member Chaplin? Here. Chair Desart? Here. Member LaPlante? Here. Member Renahan? Member Selman? Vice Chair Zay? All right, thank you. Um, any public comment? No, no public comment today. All right, then I would like to just dive right in and welcome our guest today. I see that beautiful smiling face of Laura Elman. I don't see Karina just yet. Is she on? Senator Villa? All right, we'll wait for her. First of all, we've got the beautiful smiling face of Senator Laura Elman. Laura Elman was elected to serve the residents of the 21st Senate District in November of 2018. Senator Elman currently serves as chairperson of the Financial Institutions Committee and vice chair of the Energy and Public Utilities Committee. Priorities include legislation to protect the environment and to expand access to education for all. Senator Elman is also an active member of her community, volunteering for the Naperville Fair Housing Commission, Habitat for Humanity, Feed My Starving Children, and serves as an ESL tutor. Senator Elman received her undergraduate degree from Grinnell College and a master's degree in applied statistics from the University of Iowa. She is currently working at Argonne National Lab and resides in Naperville, with her family. Welcome, Senator Elman. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. That was a lovely bio. And here I am in my home in Naperville at my kitchen table. <laughs> <laughs> like many of us are. Indeed. Like many of us are. Yes. What is going on in Springfield? Well, I'm not there, but um, we are, we've just finished up with most of the Senate business, our Senate uh, committee deadline just is, is we're right on the verge of it. So uh, we will be finishing up with all of our Senate bills really soon. And then uh, we'll be hearing and listening though, to those bills that have already passed the House. So we've already passed 352 bills in the Senate that are on their way to the House. And the House has passed something like 470 Oh, there's Senator Bia. Uh, 470 bills have passed from the House to, to our chamber. So um, obviously there are many that are, are just small. You know, I've even carried small technical language bills. Um, and a lot of the really substantial stuff, uh, for example, one of the things that we might talk about this afternoon is CJA, uh, energy. That is still being um, negotiated. So that really hasn't passed through the Senate. So, yeah. But uh, let me just say, I'm really impressed with your handout. And one of my objectives today will be to hear in greater detail uh, your positions so that I can be better informed um, when I'm on the chamber floor voting. Thanks. Excellent. That's great to hear. I'm sorry, my dogs are going a little bit crazy right now. And while I'm, while um, Senator Villa is here, let me introduce her as well. Senator Karina Villa was born in and raised in West Chicago and is the daughter of immigrant parents who owned a small business in the community, a grocery store. She was first elected to the Illinois House of Representatives in November of 2018 and subsequently to the Illinois Senate in November of 2020. She currently serves as the Vice Chair of the Behavioral and Mental Health Committee and Vice Chair of Appropriations Health Committee. Prior to her election to the Illinois General Assembly, Senator Villa served as Vice President of the West Chicago School District through, uh, 33 Board of Education. She earned her master's degree in social work from Aurora University and became a school social worker in the West Chicago and Villa Park school systems. Senator Villa has a strong record of community service and is a passionate advocate on behalf of the students and families 
who reside in the 25th district. So welcome. And any opening comments, Senator Ria? Yes, thank you so much for having us. This is great. It's uh, wonderful to be able to have these opportunities to hear about what some of your priorities are and how things are running in the county, as well as being able to report, report back. Um, but as I heard Senator Elman, Elman mention, there's so much happening and um, uh, things that uh, happen really, really quickly. Lots of lots of bills being passed. I think that's as a result of, you know, last year and not having a full legislative year. So I think a lot of us have a lot of priorities that we really want to make sure that get passed through. So um, thank you again, and I look forward to this conversation. And what are some of your priorities, Senator? If you'll, uh, if you were to look at ilga.gov and see what bills I'm sponsoring and co-sponsoring, you'll definitely see an emphasis on mental health, on um, addictions, on um, education. Um, you know, these things are near and dear to my heart. As you mentioned, as a school social worker, I am very, very concerned about the ramifications and impacts of COVID on not just the students' mental health, but also the educators. Um, and the, you know, it was very difficult going through this time frame without having um, been close with their students. And of course the trauma that many folks experienced is having um, gone through COVID themselves or had loved ones who, who went through COVID or, or even passed away from COVID. So um, times were, were really difficult and living in that level of stress for um, this amount of time has really had some significant impacts. So um, I would say um, those, those are some, some big issues and concerns and also um, focuses of my legislation um, and small businesses as well um, have really been hard hit. So um, these, these are all priorities that you'll see with the legislation that I've been um, uh, focusing on and some exciting things that I know that you all have been excited to keep an eye on has also been the um, uh, pet bills um yeah. and so really just so appreciative of your all support and um seeing uh your voices uh has really kind of given us the the energy and momentum that we've needed to um work on some of these pieces of legislation which historically have received quite a bit of opposition um so thank you for that yeah let me ask you both um, county boards are required to draw new county board district boundaries as part of the uh, reapportion process by July 1st. As the U.S. Census has indicated that 2020 census data will not be available until the end of September, what is the General Assembly's plan to address this issue? Um, we've been advised that the American Community Survey data represents only a small sample of our population that has grown and shifted across the county over the past 10 years. If a map is drawn using this limited source of data, we are concerned it would undercount our population, especially the minority communities, and this may result in legal challenges. How would you advise the county board, the DuPage County Board specifically, to proceed? Uh, I don't have terrific answers, Chairwoman Desart, but I would advise, first of all, um, I've. I did ask, I brought this up in um, a meeting today and um, the Senate leadership is aware of your concerns. The, the County Board Association, I'm not sure exactly what the association is, has been in contact. So they are well aware uh, of your concerns. Um, I would recommend um, that whatever you do um, and whatever data that you choose to, to use, you do so transparently and um, you know every step along the way, try to involve the public as much as possible. Um, you had mentioned, I think, litigation. And I think, you know, if you read the newspapers, you're already starting to see that, uh, that redistricting is just, you know, rife with, with litigation, no matter, no matter what you do, I think, uh, people will pounce on using lawsuits. So um, there will be challenges. Senator Villa? Yeah, I think so. 
Yeah, I think that just making sure that there's an open and transparent process, that there's hearings. As you know, this morning, I think was reported that the numbers um, were out and we're seeing that there's only a 0 0.03 difference with those American survey numbers with, um, uh, with the census numbers, which is really, um, th that gives, gives us a lot of um, positive uh, just affirmations, right? Um, making sure that you're just really um, candid and, and open about the process, I think is, is um, going to be uh, what I would say is the most important thing. Thank you. Um, you sa you've said that you welcome um, hearing about the county's priorities and, and we've touched upon the puppy mills. One of the county's priorities has been to eliminate the sourcing of the animals from puppy mills as these animals often end up at our animal shelter, sick, difficult to place in a loving home. We would ask that you both support, and I know Senator Villa has already signed on as a sponsor of HB 1711 that has been adopted by the House it is pending in the Senate and also SB 572 also pending in the Senate. And that one would prohibit the financing of animals from pet stores that are often at extremely high interest rates, interest rates over 100%. So we would ask that both of you would, would support both of those, those bills for us. Your feelings on those? Uh I have not decided where I'm landing on SB or HB 1711. So I'm trying to get as much information as possible. So you just brought up um, a point that I hadn't heard before. So you, you were saying that um, the sale of dogs, puppies in retail actually increases the burden on animal control. Could you? It does. Could you? flush that out for me. Cheryl, could you speak to that? Cheryl Marquet is our administrator. We can't hear you, unfortunately. Is it on now? Yes. Hi, Senator. Um, this is Cheryl Marquet. Every Monday, we did start to send out to your district offices an update of bills that the Legislative Committee has taken positions on we try and keep it a relatively short list because we don't want to overwhelm you with priorities, but I did attach a fact sheet on Monday on both those bills. And the reason that the county has gotten involved in recent years to assist the Humane Society with passage of both bills, both the sourcing of animals and the financing, is that we see it at you know the worst outcome, which is uh, people will go to a pet store in the mall, they will pay, you know, we'll see a puppy on the spot. We have a couple of individuals that have paid three to $4,000 for a puppy. They bring the puppy home, the puppy becomes sick and they end up with incredible medical bills for this puppy. In addition to the fact that before they left the store in the mall, of course they didn't have $3,000. So they financed the animal a lot of these pet stores have separate financing agencies and people are spontaneous. They, you know, your daughter falls in love with the dog and you buy it. So we've had several cases where not only has a family have to surrender this three to four to $5,000 puppy because they can't afford the $10,000 in medical bills because they've been overbred. They, their mothers weren't cared for property, properly. So you see the impacts of that. But there was one woman who she financed it on a credit card, you know, this through this financing agency. It was, as Member Desart said, over 100% interest. So she was paying the equivalent of a car payment, $700 a month for a puppy she doesn't even own. And that will be for years to come. So it's really unscrupulous, uh, just lending practices on part of these. 18 to 19 pet stores, I believe is what uh, the house sponsor said in Illinois, that you're really targeting those few facilities that are sourcing animals from these, I wouldn't call them breeders. They're not, you know, they wouldn't be licensed by anyone um, and just really inhumane practices. But the financing is the second arm. Not only is the animal sick and our animal services, sometimes we have to euthanize the animals. We try not to, but you know, a lot of people aren't able to assume a 
it's mostly a puppy. It could be a cat, you know, with those types of high medical bills. So it's really just a, unfortunate for the animals who are sick and the families who get stuck with this debt. And the medical bills as well. Senator Elman, um, maybe I'm sure you're aware that the city of Naperville adopted the Humane Pet Ordinance last January 2020. Yep. So, so Naperville is on board with, with this. Any comments from Senator Villa? Could you talk Senator Elman into signing on to this? <laughs> My role leader, you know, and so we have a very special relationship and very close you know, our, our districts touch each other. So uh, we'll definitely be extending out of maybe a few phone calls and maybe a few pictures of my, uh, my puppy that I adopted uh, from the shelter. So, you know, we'll, we'll continue that conversation. But I'm sure I know Senator Elman always does very thorough research on her bill process. So I'm sure she'll uh, make the right decision for her district. Excellent. I'm curious, any, any questions or comments from the committee? So I, you know, I did want to mention something and I'm not, you know, I, I'm not going to say that I'm going to, um, before this bill, but I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, a bill that you have listed here in opposition of taking over of the local health departments, um, you know, during a statewide disaster. So, you know, as you know, I've been kind of a loud voice in regards to um, bringing attention to manufacturing workers, as well as a disproportionately impacted areas, which we know in DuPage County, we have Addison and West Chicago. Um, you know, during the pandemic, it, in the early stages, it, it was just very, very difficult for me to watch as um, so many of these uh, workers, especially in manufacturing, had to just um, endure such um, uh, inhumane um, treatment at their work site. You know, different health departments have different abilities, uh, have different resources. And I guess I'm just very curious to hear, and not just that it, it wasn't just that, but then it was the testing, right? Um, and, and having to really scream and, and beg and then eventually obtain from the, the, the VNA a testing location in West Chicago. Um, and then the vaccines. I mean, the health department, we, the, the local mayor and myself and community partners have brought over, uh, I think last count, maybe over 8,000 vaccines uh, to West Chicago. Um, my staff, I, I can't continue to do that. My staff will quit on me. Like we're not set up to be doing this. Um, but yet we've done it because we know that, we, that, that folks need it. So we've partnered with Juul and we've partnered with PRISM to bring vaccines to West Chicago. And in fact, we had um, someone from the IDPH at our event yesterday, um, just so um, pleased to see the diversity, like the Latino community that came out to our event, which is what happened with all of the events that we hosted, because we, ha we have the connection with the community, right? We, ha it's a, we are a trusted voice. My office is a trusted voice in the community. And so I guess when I see it, it, the, how much I had to really work, work to, to bring these needed services during the pandemic to the people of West Chicago. And I would always say Addison, even though Addison isn't part of my district because they're, they were right there. They were right there in terms of need. So even though they're not my district, like I see them as part of part of the struggle, and I wanted to make sure that they were their voices were being heard, right? And I know that their representatives and senators were also, you know, making sure their voices were were heard. But I always just wanted to make sure it's Addison and West Chicago and DuPage County, Addison and West Chicago and DuPage County, Addison and West Chicago and DuPage County. So like, 
what was it overall, like by what metric are we judging the success, right? Of the health department's ability during a, pan a, a, a pandemic to respond to the needs of these disproportionately impacted areas. And so that's why um, I'm just raising an eyebrow at your opposition of Senate Bill 643. And I completely appreciate that. It was, it was very, very difficult for our health department to get vaccine from the state. We were getting it from the state and it wasn't on a consistent basis. We get 1,300 one week, 2,600 one week, 5,000 one week. I mean, it just wasn't consistent what we received from the state. Um, Cheryl, would you like to speak to that? Um, I think uh, certainly the health department uh, did the best they could with the resources they had. I think from their viewpoint, they have a very different view of IDPH. Uh, we were the only county that wasn't provided with funds to stand up um, a testing site. We had to do that on our own, which we did with the CARES Act money. But I know Lake County, early on, they got a testing site paid for by the state. So there was a real, um, the health department, and I'm speaking for the board and uh, member Garcia just got on the health board, but in their view, they felt like the county was not treated fairly in terms of allocation of resources, whether it was testing, vaccine, um, contact tracing, we did not get our fair share as the second biggest county in Illinois. That was their viewpoint. So I think this bill, um, where the all, there's 97 uh, county health departments, because there's a couple downstate that are combined. If they had to report to IDPH, they feel like they would have been worse off in a crisis that locally, I think they were able to do a partnership thanks to the Senator's leadership, you know, with jail cert set up, you know, some partnerships, but if the state did it down, we wouldn't have gotten our fair share and they feel like they didn't get their fair share. Absolutely. So, and I, I feel like I, I completely understand and appreciate what you're saying, Senator, but I think yeah. all of us here on the board received um, a ton of emails about the very same thing. We just could not get it out fast enough. I'm sorry. Sure. Go ahead. And I at Jelsert, I just want to give credit where credit is due, was a partnership with Jewel Osco, not with the health department. And it was finally, it was um, constantly going through um, other partners outside of the health department because it, it just was apparent that this working through the health department was not going to get the needs met for those who were disproportionately impacted, which was Addison and West Chicago. Um, and so to me, if you see the numbers, and I understand if you look at the numbers and you have one, you, you have 1,000 vaccines out of those 1,000, how many of those are going to Addison and West Chicago is my question and was my constant question. And um, it was a constant question of the, the testing too. How many tests were focused on Addison and West Chicago? When you look at the numbers of people dying and people getting, the, getting COVID, um, that's kind of where you go first to, to um, assist. So um, not, again, not saying that I'm looking to support this, this bill, but more so just opening a conversation and making sure to have co future conversations and open conversations of lessons learned and, and ways to prepare better for the future. And that's appreciated. Thank you. Member Renahan. Um, thank you. I just want to take a minute to, um, you know, thank you, Senator Elman. Thank you, Senator Villa, for your hard work on the criminal justice reform bill. Um, I chair our Judicial and Public Safety Committee, and um, it is the number one thing we're talking about, obviously, how we up implement this and what kind of costs are associated with it. And I do thank Senator Elman for giving me some information on timeline and kind of what we, how, what we have to do to thread the needle. But I think, um, since I do have your ears, um, I think we are looking for more information on how to thread the needle. You know, what is specifically needed? Because we had a meeting with all of our stakeholders, our public defender, our state's attorney, our clerk of the circuit court, you know, basically probation, everybody who's going to be impacted financially. And the bottom line is we were told it's gonna to take $62 million to implement this. And I, I don't feel that that was probably what was intended, but um, we had seen some very uh, conservative, uh, I don't know, conservative, liberal, I don't know. Well, our state's attorney told us that they had looked at what the Commonwealth Wealth of Virginia did and for every 75 body camps, they had to pay for one assistant state's attorney. 
I mean, that would cause us, I think, to go up 47 assistant state's attorney in DuPage County alone. So, you know, just looking for more guidance, um, I think, you know, I think as much as we are trying to protect brown and black people, you know, in this legislation, for some reason, our county board just approved, you know, I think something like 40 more tasers as part of this. So I think there are some gaps or some, you know, maybe misunderstandings. And I just want to be as clear as possible on how, how do we best implement this. And this is, as I, I realized, this was not an overnight pass in the middle of the night. This was a five-year process. And I appreciate all the work that you all have done. But, um, you know, if we can get some trailer bills or maybe you have some info for us today on that. I don't have any info uh, specific to your your comments, Julie. But um, if you have, if you can send me uh, the estimates that you've got, maybe broken down by by topic, I can learn more and I can uh, try to find out a little bit more for you. Um, have you or the state's attorney um, talked to or compared notes with other? counties, particularly Collar counties, like maybe Kane, Lake, on uh, unestimated uh, implementation costs? You know, we really kind of are the making the charge here faster than other counties. Surprisingly, right? DuPage County doing a great job, right? Um, so we have more, probably more information than our other counties have. We've, we've looked, we've got some, you know, I don't know, little bits of information from counties that have sort of implemented in, over the past, say, three years. I'm not seeing anything like the numbers that we came up with. But again, mm -hmm. you know, we're trying to do the, you know, A plus job. So I think we're getting, you know, A plus 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 costs. So, um, you know, like I said, just trying to thread the needle and anything you all can do in Springfield um, in terms of, you know, is legislative intent or anything to help us out, I, I look forward to. And I will definitely send both of you, if that's okay, Senator, Senator Via, send you as well. Um, maybe you can tell us at least where we're going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, send it over and um, I'll, I'll try to find out as much as I can, uh, particularly about the, uh, the body cam and state's attorney, you know, ratio that you mentioned. Um, I hadn't heard about that. I haven't heard that anywhere else, so. It's only in one state, but that's what they quoted us, so. <laughs> okay. I have heard that there are uh, formidable data storage costs associated with body cams, and that's kind of a hidden cost. That did come up when we were, uh, were talking about the bill, but not the, uh, the additional headcount. So I'll look forward to hearing more about that. Thanks. Member so Selman. Oh, I'm sorry. Remember what happened? Did you have more? Okay, Member Selman. No, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Any other? Oh, Member Chaplin. Yeah. Thanks so much. And thank yeah. And you know, Julie, I was going to mention. You know, um, both of you. Thank you for your um, hard work on that criminal justice reform bill. I know it was hard. It was a controversial issue, um, but you two really um, were at the forefront, fighting that good fight. Um, so I just really appreciate all those efforts. Like I said, especially out here, I know it wasn't easy, and. Um, Karina, I would like to thank you for coming out really early in support of the Hoop House. I know that a lot of people were not in support of it. I mean, I, this might seem like a silly thing, but for gardening, for our people, it really is important. I really appreciate your strong early advocacy. You know, a lot of people don't want to jump on at the beginning, um, but I think it shows real leadership when you get behind initiatives like that and take the lead. So I really appreciate that. Um, as far as House Bill 3653, yeah, I just want to reiterate what member Renahan said, if we can get some guidance, I don't know if you're, if you hear from any other counties that it's going to cost 62 million to implement, I would really, I think that would be great information for us. Or if you hear from other counties that it's not going to be nearly that much, I think it would be um, beneficial for us to hear back from you. Um, I have reached out to uh, some people in Lake County as well as Will County, and they really think our numbers are very, very inflated. So I just be very curious to hear what you're hearing. And if you're getting any other, you know, if you're hearing these um, numbers from any of the other um, counties and, um, you know, like I said, I keep that, keep that line of communication open. And if, and if you are seeing this, maybe his member said there will need to be other bills that, um, you know, follow up. But, um, you know, from what people I've talked to in Lake and Will, are not expecting these 
um, to incur these costs. I'll follow up with Kane and Kendall, as you're aware, I represent um, parts of yeah. Well, Thank so. you. Yep. And I can follow up with Will for sure. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's really helpful. I want to ask one more question, being respectful of your time. But one of our big initiatives, one of the primary sources of funding the county receives from the state are income, ta income tax revenues received under the local government uh, distributive uh, fund, the LGDF. It's an estimated $10 million per year. The governor has proposed reducing the share received by counties and municipalities by 10%, and that's on top of previous reductions. Um, at a time when local governments are struggling to address a, the global pandemic, of course. Can you please advise us as to your position on this reduction? Well, I'd like everybody to have more money. <laughs> um, but I know that, well, you know, there were some recent reports that came out that uh, revenue estimates are actually a little bit higher than expected um, at the state level. So income tax, corporate tax, and even I think sales tax is higher than anticipated. So um, I don't know what um, the final LGDF number will be, but it might be softened a little bit. I really don't know. Um, of course, I'd love for it to be, you know, at the state level, you know, we've got to make sure that we've got enough money to, you know, to fill our budget needs at the state level. And I don't ever want to do it at the expense of local government because you guys are also, you know, have got to, to meet your obligations and serve your constituents. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that that can, uh, can be softened. I'm also glad to have ARP, which should help us all, um, both at the state and at the county, um, with some of these constraints, you know, so, so that, that should help too. Thank you. Senator Villa? Yeah, I mean, this is something I said to my mayors that I've been, you know, in touch with on a regular basis that, you know, fair tax didn't pass, right? Um, fair tax didn't pass. And I kept hearing from uh, mayors before this uh, with these same concerns saying, we need more money. And then out of the next sentence, a poster tax. So, you know, doesn't grow on trees. I wish it did, but fair tax didn't pass. We're in a we're in difficult financial situation. I also like um, my friend Senator Elman. Wish everyone we could just give money out to everyone, um, but that's just not the way it is. And so we will definitely keep an eye on it. And I I hear you loud and clear. Um, hopefully there's going to be some um, relief federally coming down here with some of um, you know big projects at least that I know have been on the list for many of our um, municipalities uh, when it comes to roads and bridges and uh, stoplights. Um, those are some really big uh, concerns that folks are having across the state of Illinois. As you all know, there's been um, some district projects as well uh, with our capital bill that, you know, COVID, because of COVID, there was lots of kind of stops to some of these projects People weren't driving as much. There wasn't as much uh, money there for the fuel tax and uh, some of the, the casino, um, you know, momentum that had started kind of slowed down as well. So, um, but but definitely, I understand there's a real need for 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 money, and so I don't want to. Um, make any kind of um, promises, but also having just the realization of the, we were really hoping to get that fair, fair tax passed and it, and it didn't. So um, that was like a bucket of ice water on uh, the, the morning after election day. Mm -hmm. um, Member Chaplin. Just one other comment really quick. Um, Karina, that bill, the health department bill that you were talking about um, that we're opposing, can I, what is that House bill number? It's uh, Senate Bill 643. Senate 643, okay. Senate 643. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to take a look at it, and maybe see if it's something we want to maybe remain neutral on or, you know, take a double look at that and just see what, what that is. So just for our next meeting, possibly. Thank, Thank you. you. 
one thing that I noticed in both of your conversations, although it seemed like, you know, um, the county you guys are opposed to it and Senator Villa, you said that you hadn't come out at a position, but it, I heard you both saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, IDPH did have, you know, there were limitations to what IDPH was able to do and their responsiveness to the local, to the local need. And so I'm, I'm almost convinced to oppose this bill after, <laughs> after this conversation um, because of that, the, the lack of quick response to local need on the, for, on the side of IDPH. Number seven? Like, I think that one of the reasons that I mention it is because, so I had multiple daily exchanges with IDPH during the beginning stages of COVID and um, then when the vaccine came out. And there was always this being done, always. It was like, it's, you know, reach out to your um, L LHD, it's not IDPH, like reach out. And to me, I mean, if it was just one entity, then I could say, well, you're the person in charge here. Mm. Um, instead of having to deal with that, because that was, um, that was when I finally said, got us to the point where we, we um, but by the relentless um, phone calls that I was making to anyone who would listen, that I finally was able to get that connection with um, Jewel Osco and started saying, we're gonna host clinics. And we hosted and hosted and hosted and hosted clinics um, to, to get the vaccine to, to West Chicago. But um, there was no Jewel Osco, if you will, for factory workers in the middle, in the beginning stages of the pandemic. There was no, it wasn't like, oh, let me call this other outside entity to see if they'll be willing to come in and see um, the fact that workers in my district are being given beard nets instead of face masks. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, if we had like one place, like that's just kind of why um, it just, it, yeah, and I, and I should probably talk to the Senate sponsor about that, the, the bill too, to see like where uh, uh, Senator Murphy kind of is, it, where this came from. It, 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 so I should maybe have that conversation too. Senator Selman? Yeah, if I could just sort of echo um, some of the comments that Senator Elman brought up. I think one of the things that was deeply concerning to this board is that we would hear from our health department, not only our we ready, but all the physicians we work with, all the medical centers, they're all ready to go. And we constantly couldn't get vaccines from IDPH and we would get differing information. And we would at some point be blamed on the problem. We were ready to go months before the supply was ready. The supply wasn't given in a consistent fashion from IDPH and then national supply started being diverted to the private you know, entities like Walgreens and CVS and Jewel Osco. So, I think, unfortunately, the way that IDPH decided to centralize distribution at the beginning of the pandemic did a lot of harm to the county level being able to execute when it had the plans ready. Um, and I also see there's just been some sort of slow response on picking up some of the recent um, vaccine clinics and getting them rescheduled. I represent Addison and Bensonville, and so we have heard mm -hmm. the calls. We've worked very closely with our mayors to try to get as much resources as we can, but if the vaccines aren't being given to us, we can't put them in arms, and that's really, I think, been our biggest challenge. And I think we all knock on wood that hopefully we'll never have to deal with something this awful again, but if something like this were to happen again, I think IDPH, I would hope, would give a lot more local control because we were ready before we had the supply. Thank you, Chairwoman. Member Garcia. Member Garcia. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, I just, yeah, I just wanted to say, you know, when I got on the health board, you know, I heard all of these concerns. And so I was like, well, this is so wrong. And so I worked with uh, Representative Conroy and Representative Costa Howard to try to contact people at IDPH. And we could not get a phone call back from them at all. I mean, it was just nonstop calling and, and they just wouldn't return a phone call. So that was so frustrating to me because I thought, oh, for sure, you know, we'll get somebody to, you know, get us some help and get us clearer answers for the for the health boards, and and we couldn't get anybody to contact us. So there definitely mm -hmm. is a communication issue between the IDPH and the, the health board. So I just wanted to let you know that. 
Senator Laura Elman and Senator Karina Bia, thank you so much for joining Hold us. On. All right, I sorry. See, Last comments? Uh, Lynn LaPlante has got her hand raised. Oh, I didn't see member LaPlante. Thank you so much, Senator Elman, and thank you, Chairwoman. I'm just really going to echo what, what you've already heard, but I think it's it can't be overstated that because of the um, lack of supply, the county was unable to plan, right? So with this constant um, vacillation between amounts, and I mean drastic, we weren't, people weren't able to make appointments, let alone, so if even if we had known, okay, this is what you're getting, every single week, or this is what the next month is going to look like. Um, it made planning nearly impossible. And um, Senator Villa, to your point about equity, I have been sitting on the um, HEART task force, and I know that someone from your staff has been sitting on those meetings as well, so I'm sure you know all about it. Um, the county health department has been working very, very hard on making sure that the hardest hit communities are the ones who are also getting the vaccines. and. At, um, really attacking it from all angles. Um, awareness, education, transportation, um, making sure that in the communities that need it the most, there are vaccines getting there. But it has been a challenge. And while we were waiting for the vaccine supply to become more robust, we have been working a lot on building vaccine confidence within the community, especially in the communities that are more hesitant. So um, we haven't just been treading water. <laughs> Or maybe we, maybe we have. It looks like we're sitting there, but underneath we're paddling furiously. So we've been working, and I'm absolutely thrilled with the work that this HEART um, committee has been doing um, to actually try to make up for the lack of vaccines and help that we've been getting from the IDPH. So um, just wanted to make sure that you heard that loud and clear and what we were trying to do and how we were having to basically do double work on the ground here. Thank you really like to see eventually like how many um, folks from 60185 got vaccinated through the health department. I think that would be really helpful. Okay, we will ask, we will ask um, Karen Ayala that question. How many people in 60185 got vaccinated? And get back to you, Senator. Senator Laura Elman, Senator Karina Villa, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you'll come back and join us anytime you have something to talk about, but we'll for sure invite you back in a couple of months. So thank you so much. Thank Have you. This has day. been a great, lively conversation. I appreciate it. Thank it has you. been a wonderful discussion. Thank you. All right. In other business committee, um, action item. Um, I'd like to uh, get a motion to support action item, um, support SB 2068, which calls, which amends the Nurse Practice Act. Um, it ratifies and approves the Nurse Licensure Compact, uh, which allows for the issuance of multi-state licenses, which allows nurses to practice in their home state, as well as other states. Member Liz Chaplin initiated this request. So any comments, Member Chaplin? Thank you, Chair Desart. So in looking at this legislation, I just came across it, and um, I thought it would be beneficial for the county to support, um, because when... Uh, nurses have um, licenses that they can cross states that gives them more flexibility to go work um, in obviously other places. So I thought that this might be a way to help us get some staff over into our convalescent center by giving nurses in the state the option, you know, to go all over and work. And um, I think in the legislation, I should have pulled it up, but it does mention that um, it does help um, fill spots in like nursing care centers and hospitals and things like that where it's hard to get um where it's hard to keep and retain those nurses. So that this might be something worthwhile for us to just throw our support behind. And yeah, I think Cheryl you. might be able to have a little more information on it. Would you like to make the motion? Oh, that's fine. Um, did you I th did you move to approve it or? I asked for a motion to approve Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll um, so moved. Okay, second. Second. Second by member Redahan. Um, discussion. Um, Cheryl Marquet, do you have anything to uh, mention about this? Um, no, uh, Member Chaplin did uh, forward a Sun Times article that talked about there's 34 other states that are part of this multi nurse licensure compact, and that we know the staffing shortages at the care center 
and uh, about 50% of the RNs in this state are nearing retirement age. Wow. So just another piece of the puzzle that would help maybe, you know, have some more nurses because it talks about waiving some, every state that you're licensed in, you have to, you know, pay a fee. So this breaks down some barriers from nurses from other, who maybe been licensed in other state to practice here. So I think it's really positive for the care center. I should tell you the house companion bill did not make it out of committee. And this bill is struggling to pass uh, because there is a little bit of opposition, I guess, from ask me, I'm not sure why, but they extended the deadline to April 30th. So it has another week to pass. So hopefully it can move forward and they can reach a compromise on it. All right, thank you so much. Um, Teresa, let's take a roll call on um, support of this bill, please. Member Chaplin? Aye. Chair Desart? Aye. Member LaPlante? Aye. Member Ranahan? Aye. Member Salmon? Aye. Vice Chair Zay? All eyes. Thank you so much. So it passes. Thank you all so much. Um, under old business, I'd just like to say um, thank you to this, the board as a whole for passing member um, Pete Deciani's initiative earlier today, mm -hmm. County Board, that resolution in support of mandating Medicaid coverage of ABA therapy for children with autism. Initially, member Deciani came to me and requested that we take up the issue here in committee. However, realizing that the County Board vote would happen, um, wouldn't happen then until May at the close of uh, Springfield's le legislative session. So member Deciani asked if it was okay to take it straight to County Board and of course, I hope you'll agree with my decision that whatever it takes to get the good work done, we needed to do it. So thank you all for passing that. Any other old business? Moving on to new business, Cheryl Marquet has some comments that she just learned about um, action items in Springfield today. Cheryl? Yeah, I will keep it brief. Um, thanks for that great conversation. We touched on the, the LGDF for focusing on redistricting, uh, the sourcing of animals, you know, that was the first time that bill passed the house. It's been introduced for many years. And I really want to give member Krajewski and Chip Humes the credit because the Humane Society works really hard, but they had 42 votes a couple of days before final passage. And member Krajewski and Chip got the rest, it ended up with, I think, 76 votes. So it, it's not going to be a slam dunk in the Senate, but I think we have a good window. So that's kind of exciting. Um, our lobbyists are working to try and shake loose some capital projects. When Mark Poulos was here, maybe a month ago, he talked about some projects. I know Representative Conroy had allocated $5 million to the county for the health department to construct that kind of central receiving center over at the old youth home where individuals experiencing mental health or substance abuse crisis could be taken and they could receive wraparound services and have a place for 30, 60, 90 days. Uh, to receive a support, you know, support versus going to just the emergency room. So we're trying to shake uh, loose that project as well as a couple of wastewater treatment uh, capital projects. And then I think I just want to tell you really quickly, um, Joy Hens will be bringing up an environmental next week, but we had two bills that uh, Senator uh, Glowiak Hilton is sponsoring. And it's not that we oppose the intent, but they could be a significant financial mandate on the county. So Chip is reaching out to her. The first one is Senate Bill 590, and it requires all counties to make their facilities available um, with sharp receptacles for sharp, you know, recycling. Municipalities are not mandated, they may. So they don't mandate drugstores, they mandate county buildings to have these receptacles, which are fine. Joy says they're about $1,000. But it doesn't say, obviously, if you put a receptacle in your building, you're going to have to be responsible for the disposal costs. And those can be thirty dollars to $40,000 a year. So uh, we're just reaching out to her. So I want to oppose the bill, but it would be a financial impact on the county. So Illinois EPA has talked about doing a SHARPS program. All the pharmacies, as, as you know, they have an RX box program already. So... I don't think it'll be that much more difficult for them to put a sharps container next to the RX box, but they're refusing to do so. So they're turning to the counties to do it. So we'll work through that. And then the other bill um, is Senate Bill 1676. 
this deals with apartment recycling. And for those of you, I'm sure remember chaplains where, you know, most apartment complexes do not have recycling and it is a big issue, there's no doubt. But those apartment complexes all have their own waste hauling agreements, which the county does not control. Um, Senate Amendment 1 to this bill, Senate Bill 1676, would mandate that counties as part of their solid waste plans ensure that every resident of every apartment building has a receptacle and can recycle. So obviously, I don't know how many apartments we have in DuPage County, I would be a lot. And obviously, Joy and Andy cannot, you know, there's just no way we can force recycling onto landlords that don't want to pay the cost as part of their waste hauling contract. So it's well intended, but that's Joe McCoy's like, oh my God, what are we going to do with this bill? And we don't want to oppose it because we recognize the importance, but that's not something we can do. 90% of apartments are in municipalities. So, you know, we could work with the mayors and try and figure out how to encourage recycling, but certainly we couldn't do that as part of our solid waste plan. So, um, Chip has asked Senator Hilton to maybe work with us over the summer, work with, you know, Chair Rutledge of Environmental, figure out how we can maybe work towards that goal. Because she did have a bill, Senate Bill 592, the renter's right to recycle that would just mandate the landlords to do recycling. And of course it couldn't get out of committee because the realtors opposed it. So again, you can't get your bill, you come to the, <laughs> to the county. So it's fine, we'll work through them, but I want you to be aware our lobbyist is spending some time on those two bills. Thank you so much for your hard work. I know you're on this stuff 24 seven. I get emails from you on Sundays and you're just awesome. Thank you so much. Any other new business? Okay, I do wanna let you know that I know that 4.30 is not an ideal time. The only reason why today's meeting was so late is because it was when the senators could join us. So we're going on their schedules, not our ne necessarily our schedules. Uh, we will have a 4.30 meeting the, uh, the next meeting, which is May 11th, because we've got I'm it's such a fan girl. We've got uh, Congressman Underwood coming in to um, to talk to us then. So I, I really enjoy having these guests, these legislative guests, and I hope you do too. But because of that, we kind of have to go by their schedules. You so then, oh, Cheryl, I'm sorry. Uh, Congresswoman Underwood can come at two. Oh, she can come at two. So we're going to schedule this for two o'clock on the 11th. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, topic, great. If there are certain topics that you want her to address. I mean, we, I feel like we should kind of narrow down for her. Yeah. No, I think we like, I thought we talked about the um, any more guidance regarding the um, American Relief Plan, number one, and also to talk about the proposed one point nine trillion dollar infrastructure plan. I thought we were going to in, you know, if you have any ideas for Congressman Underwood, please come up with questions for for two weeks from today anyway. OK, so it will be at two o'clock. And again, these hours are dictated, I apologize for 4.30, but they're dictated by when our guests can come. So with that, I will take a motion to adjourn. Um, actually, excuse me, um, we didn't have a uh, motion or a second for uh, roll call originally, and we also need to approve the minutes. I was informed by um, Nick Alfonso. Okay, so we need a motion and a second for roll call? Correct. We've never had a motion or a second for a rope fault before. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Um, but I may have been so excited about the senators that I may have forgotten about the minutes. So can I get a motion to approve the minutes? Oh, second. So moved. Okay, motion by Chaplain. Second. Second. Second by uh, Selman. Roll call for, to approve the minutes. Thank you. Um, Member Chaplain? Aye. Chair Desart? Aye. Member LaPlante? Aye. Member Renahan? Aye. Member Salmon? Aye. Vice Chair Zay? All ayes um, except uh, one absent. Okay, thank you. And again, we've never done a roll call, or we've never done a for, uh, motion or a second for a roll call, so I'm not sure what that's about. Are we good now, <laughs> State's Attorney? Yeah, Madam Chair, I apologize that was unclear. What we uh, had intended was a roll call for the minutes. Awesome. Okay, thank you. So now we'll take a motion and a second for adjournment. So moved. Chaplain? Second. second. And Selman, second. Roll call, please, to adjourn. Uh, Member Chaplain? Aye. Chair Bart? Aye. 
Member LaPlante? Aye. Member Renahan? Aye. Member Salmon? Aye. And Vice Chair Zay. All right, thank you. See you in two weeks.